Welcome to Perf Damage. This is the show where we chat about lesser known histories of Hollywood. That's right. And today we are going to talk about the history of Technicolor. We're going to tell the history of the company because I don't think it's told. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows what Technicolor is. Yeah, or they focus on a movie shot in Technicolor, but they don't talk about Technicolor the company. Yeah, it didn't just come out fully formed as Technicolor. That's right. There so were many there are processes before we got to the three strip. A lot of trial and error. Lots of trial um, and error. Several different iterations of the technology. Several different. <laughs> so, you know, this is that history. Yeah. So if you want to hear more about the history of Technicolor. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hey, movie lovers, I'm Adam. And I'm Charlotte. And welcome to to Perf Perf Damage. Damage. We're a movie-obsessed husband and wife team who work in the film industry. I oversee film restoration at the oldest studio in Hollywood. And I bring the inside track from film development and production. And we love to explore the hidden tales of movies past and present. So join us for a cinematic journey like no other. From classic gems to examining the art of the double feature. This is Perf Damage. Popcorn pop, wine at the ready, let's press play. Let's start off with something kind of fun. I'm going to say the word technicolor, and I want you to tell me what that means to you. I don't feel I was prepared for this question. <laughs> um, yeah, we didn't talk about this one no, beforehand. So, so. so you mean like yeah. when I hear the word Technicolor, what do I think? Yeah, what does it mean to you? What does When you hear the word Technicolor, what is like your definition of what it is? Well, other than being the process for the movies, which I think is not what you want, I think just it represents a rainbow of colors or anything super colorful. I mean, you hear it in a book, it something's described as a, a technicolor sky or something like that. Like it, it means something that's very colorful and yeah. Bright, beautiful. Right. Yeah. It's become an adjective, right? right. It's right. It's no longer yeah, it's like the Xerox, name of a company. A Kleenex. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's now reached that you, like you said, technicolor rainbow, right? That means something I'm bright, get headbutted, beautiful at the start of the episode. Colorful. Yeah, you're gonna have a bloody yeah, nose. Yeah, this here is Asta. If you don't know Asta, this is Asta. <laughs> yes, the company didn't just come right out of the gate that way, right? It took years and years of development, of R and D, of trial and error well, for for them to become the Technicolor that we know today, right? Right, right. And when we think Technicolor, there's really one guy that is Mister Technicolor, and that is Herbert Kalmus. I mean, in fact, that was the name of his autobiography was called Mr. Mr. Technicolor. Technicolor. The first company that Herbert Kalmus started was KC&W. Right. He was uh, the K. Of he the was KC the K. And, uh, and he met the C, Daniel Comstock, while he was at MIT. They were both studying physics. Physics. After they graduated, I think they both got PhDs and mm-hmm. then Herbert was teaching and then he needed a side hustle. So they started this consulting engineering firm right yeah with another guy William Westcott basically people came to them with ideas for things and they had to kind of figure out how to make them work so they would sort of reverse engineer yeah they were engineers while Herbert was at MIT he published a paper that paper was the basis of the electrocardiogram which became the basis of the lie detector they created a first speed camera yeah it was a flash frame camera flash frame camera was a very high speed camera that was supposed to measure speed Mm -hmm. by taking a series of pictures. Yeah, so it's like the first speed gun, basically. Yeah, exactly. They formed a company called the Exelon Company, which created a new abrasive. A company called Protein Products Company, which used the cast-off blood at slaughterhouses uh, to form the basis of a bunch of other products. I think it's interesting to, to know that Herbert was already a very successful businessman by the time he started Technicolor. Right. Let's get into Technicolor. How okay. did how did we form Technicolor? How do we form the actual company? Well, when he was at the engineering firm, there was a guy that came to him with an idea. He wanted to fix an issue that he was seeing with motion picture projectors. So at the time, there was a color film process called Kinema Color, and it was a red and green. And 
it worked by alternating a red and green frame in succession, and your brain would translate those red and green images into a color image. So if you can or imagine... Or into headaches, basically, is what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> well, you, you jump in the gun here. <laughs> so you, by flashing red and then green, then red and green, your brain would turn it into color, but it was giving people headaches because of the flashing. Right. And this guy said, I've got an idea... I'm going to use a mirror and a projector, and it's going to stop the flickering, but I can't figure out how to do it. So he comes to them. They try. They have several attempts to do it. They fail. And then they go to him, and they say, look, instead of trying to fix the issue, the problem with kinema color, if your goal is to have color film, you should focus on developing a color film process. And the guy said, nah, I'm not interested. Peaced out. <laughs> they thought... This is a really good idea. So two years after they started the KCMW company, they founded Technicolor to focus on color film. And their other companies funded Technicolor. What was the first thing that Technicolor did? In 1916, they patented a process called Technicolor Process 1. It was similar to Kenema Color. The thing is that the projector is different. It had two separate bulbs, that one shown through the red frame and one shown through the green frame. And then they would go into a mirror, and then the mirror was focused down so that it overlapped the two images. So this worked really well in the lab, but not out in the real world. They shot a film called The Gulf Between. Right, 1917. It was the very first Technicolor feature film. To be publicly exhibited or shown. It is lost today, so right. we, don't, we don't really know much about it. There are a couple frames that have survived, but that's right. it. But... The first time they went to show it publicly to exhibit their new process, calamity ensued, right? Of course, as it always does in a demo. Because the the projector was a specially built projector, of course. Well, they tested it. It went fine. But when it came to the public, the focus apparatus broke, literally snapped off. And so it was unfixable. It didn't work out. It actually did more damage to the name Technicolor than it did to help them further along. Right. And so they had to go back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board. And they did. They were not discouraged by this. So in 1921, they came up with Technicolor process number two. This was known as the cemented print process. The second process used a beam splitter. One side had a red light filter. The other had a green filter. And when a frame of film was shot, two copies would get recorded onto the film strip. One red filtered image, one green filtered image. In the lab, they were able to split out the red and the green records by printing all the red images to one strip of film and then all the green filtered images to another. After they split them up, they took these two strips of film and they cemented the strips together, joining the red and the green to create a color film image. But by gluing the two strips of film together, they were also creating prints that were twice as thick as a normal 35 millimeter film. With process two, they run out to Hollywood and no one's really interested, but Metro Pictures said they'll loan them a star, Anime Wong. Right. And they'll loan them a crew. They're not going to pay them. So the crew basically just came to set and, and shot movies on, on their own time. I'm sure everybody loved that. Yeah, and they were kind of forced to do it by the company they worked for. And they made a film called Toll of the Sea, 1922. It is the second feature film produced in Technicolor, but the first one produced in Hollywood and in Technicolor. And the first to be widely. Distributed wide, widely, yeah. Right. Um, it was not a very popular film. In fact, Anime Wong said that this film will never see the screen. This movie was basically really more of a jumping point off because Douglas Fairbanks was one of the few people that actually saw the film. Mm -hmm. And he was very impressed by it. Really impressed with the color. He was developing a swashbuckling pirate film called The Black Pirate. Yep. Um, and he had all of these illustrations and colorful costume ideas. And he said, the only way that I'm going to be able to pull this off and really do justice to the subject matter is by shooting it in color. So he bankrolls the film himself. They spend six months developing the film process. Yeah, doing tests, costume uh, what, tests, what colors work tests. best, and right. you know he really wanted the colorful sails to pop, the costumes to pop. Yeah, and he was focused more on that kind of stuff where Technicolor was really more focused on trying to get skin tones. Right, correct. they wanted natural color. Right, but he wasn't interested in that. Not at and all. And he was bankrolling it, so they kind of had to do what 
Yeah, they, he spent two million dollars of his own money to develop this process. Yeah. I mean, and this was honestly really important for Herbert and for Technicolor because they were able to have all of this testing paid for, where they were able to kind of push the technology and see what worked and what didn't on actual film. So Black Pirate comes out. It's a massive success. Which is a blessing and a curse. Right. Why? It's great because everybody wanted a print. Everybody wanted a print of this film. But the prints had an issue. Because there were these double cemented prints, they were prone to cupping. They were prone to coming apart. They were prone to scratches. Projectionists hated these prints. So they were having prints returned. They were having to replace prints or totally redo them. And it ended up costing them a lot of money. And they thought everything would be okay because they thought that they were going to be shooting a big MGM picture. Right. Uh, that was called... The Mysterious Island. Island. Yep. Yeah. And they thought they were going to be shooting that. It was going to be an all-color extravaganza. It was going to be a big MGM musical. Yes. Yes. And MGM decided it was too expensive. They were spending way too much money in, yeah, in pre-production. Pre and, and so they canceled it. <laughs> so so their, their next big project that they were counting on to get by went poof. Yeah. So that sucked. Yeah. They went back to the drawing board. Technicolor started focusing on all the things that they needed to fix. They needed to fix their printing process. The double thick prints were not working. Yeah, almost put them out of business. Yeah, so. the color process, they wanted to have more control over how the look of the films were because they didn't have control. And that's uh, the Black Pirate, they didn't feel, was really showcasing how good Technicolor could look. And... Despite its success. Right. And Herbert also was very convinced that films that were going to be shot in color needed to be fully conceived in color. So they go back to the drawing board. And in 1928, they came out with their newest patent, which was the imbibition process, Technicolor process number three, which was a dye printing process. And this eliminated the need for the double thick cemented prints. And all of that could be on one piece of film. So at this point they were they were still working. They you know, they weren't shooting features in Technicolor at this point, but they were doing a lot of inserts for various films. Right. So they'd have one reel or one scene that was shot in Technicolor, so the picture would have yeah, a lot one of color scene. Musicals at the time, right. they would they you know advertise the one color scene in a big right. way to get people in. Right. Or uh, they actually started their own company called Colorcraft Pictures right. and they started shooting travel logs to highlight what all you could do with Technicolor. Yeah, and this is really where they were kind of showing off the limits of the technology, right? The, like how how beautiful things could be. Right. People would go and they see these shorts that are travel logs, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. So another interesting thing that was happening as color film was becoming more popular, other departments within a film production were having to change. And one of those was the makeup department because you couldn't do the same kind of makeup you were doing for black and white films for color films. Right. And you had a really good quote from Purse Westmore. Was working on a Marilyn Miller film called Sally. And he said, we gave her the prettiest peaches and cream makeup we knew. Using a very light touch because of the camera's color magnification, we were horrified when her face turned up a bright red in the rushes. Mine was almost equally red until, on checking, we found that her face had picked up a red reflection from the red and white checkered cover of the table she was leaning on. And this discovery of the importance of color near the player was a keystone for much of our later work. It's interesting, just uh, by changing one aspect of technology, like color, it affected all the departments, right. not just the camera department. Right, right. So now that Technicolor has had the process number one, they made some changes. They made process two. They improved on that with process three. And now Herbert decided now's the time I really have to focus on natural color. So get away from the two strip and add that third strip because he knew having the three strips was the only way to reproduce natural color. Right. He was working on trichromatic theory, right? The right. With the three primary colors, right, red, blue, and green, um, that you can create all other colors by mixing them. Right. So, in 1932, they patented Technicolor process number four, which was their 
three strip color process. Oh yeah. So one of the big differences that they did with process number four was they said that their color consultant department, which had been around the whole time, they had a, you could buy the package, you could have the color consultants from Technicolor come and help you shoot your film, but nobody wanted to pay for that. They made it mandatory for the three strip process. So if you wanted to shoot in three strip Technicolor, you had to hire the Technicolor consultants that they, means they were on set. They helped you choose colors for your sets and costumes. costumes. Everything. They were, yeah, they were part of it from the very beginning. Because he wanted to be involved in their success, and he knew the only way to do that was to control all of that. And he was right. Yeah, he absolutely was right. Right. Um, so they start the three strip process. They have some tests. They take it around to the studios, and the studios aren't interested. They were probably kind of off put by the fact that they had to use their people because they're. They're the professionals. They're the studios. And, yeah. you know, can you, you imagine Jack me. Warner? You don't tell me how to make a movie. I tell you how to make a movie. <laughs> That's Jack Get Warner. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> He'd be on the phone doing that. Yeah, though. he would definitely be on the phone. With a smile on his face. <laughs> so, yeah, their first camera cost $30,000. That's $500,000 today. That is Ooh, a very that's, expensive camera. That's an expensive camera. Yeah. So, okay, anyway, they're shopping it around. And none of the big guys want it. So, who, so you, got, you got a little guy. Yeah. And who do they go to? Uh, his name was uh, Walt Disney. Walt freaking Disney. He wasn't freaking Disney yet. He was just Walt Disney. Oh, he was just Walt. Yes. Yeah. At this point. The, the freaking comes later. The freaking later. comes later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They went to Walt Disney and he loved it. He loved it so much that he said, I'll, I'll shoot with this. I'll do my, you know, my cartoons in this. If you sign a three-year exclusivity contract with me and having no other prospects at the time, they said, all right, cool. Sure. Disney loved the process so much that he was already working on a, on a short called Flowers and Trees, mm -hmm. which he was shooting in black and white. Right. And he ended up scrapping what they'd already shot. And he also wanted to make sure that it was successful. So he went to his pal, Sid Grauman, owner of the Chinese Theater, and asked him for a favor. And what does he say? Walt, if you make flowers and trees in the Technicolor process, you've got a booking at my Chinese theater. The picture and Technicolor are made for each other. <laughs> <laughs> Such a goof. Uh. <laughs> yeah, so it ended up premiering at the Chinese theater in front of Strange Interlude. No one remembers Strange Interlude, but they all remember the very first Academy Award winner for animated shorts. Color in it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Flowers and trees. Flowers and trees. Yeah. Yep. Won the Academy Award. So their first Academy Award for Technicolor. First Academy Award for Technicolor. First, first Academy Award Walt for Disney. Disney, and the very first animated short to earn the Academy Award. And Hollywood took notice. They well, saw yeah, flowers people, and trees. People lined up around the block to see the short, yeah, not the feature. Not the feature. Yeah. And MGM was interested. RKO was interested. And everybody went to Herbert Kalmus and said, hey, we want to shoot in Technicolor. But he had this problem because he had just signed this three-year exclusivity deal. deal. With so, Walt freaking Disney. With Walt freaking Disney. Herbert goes to Walt. He, you know, gets down on his knees and says, Walt, please, please, Walt. No. He talks to Walt, and they, they're both little guys just trying to make it big so they come to an agreement they change the three years to a one-year deal and yeah he didn't want to hurt herbert kalmus's yeah. prospects yeah so. yeah so they changed that and a year later other studios started shooting yeah. with it so two years later the first live action short premieres in technicolor it's called la cucaracha shot by rko this short is just a delight it's not remembered well it won the Academy a, Award. I think it gets a bad rap. It's it's cute. It's fine. I, I think it's great. Um, yeah. You know, they use emotional lighting in it. You know, someone's upset and there's red lights right. and things like that. And uh, the costumes are really colorful mm -hmm. and bright. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a it's a, a great short. And so did the Academy. They gave it an Academy Award. What's that leave? That leaves your first all Technicolor three strip feature, feature film. film, right? Right. <laughs> 
So RKO shoots one. It's called Becky Sharp. Becky Sharp. Here is the screen as you now know it in its customary shades of black and white. Here it is, flooded with the rich reality of natural color. This specially prepared scene of Miriam Hopkins as Becky Sharp shows her transformed from phantom shadows into the breathless beauty of living color by the greatest achievement in motion pictures since the advent of sound. You know, it was father who shipped me off to India to hunt the blasted pachyderm. I know your dear little sister, Media, told me all about it. But then, uh, what were you doing in India, John? Your son? It's not remembered all that well, this film. But it is the very first, it is remembered because it was the first Technicolor feature film. Feature film, yeah. right, right. Um, the colors are kind of uh, a little too much. Well, they call it offensive use of color. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you had a couple quotes. Yeah, there was one critic who said, there's no sex appeal to a gal who appears as if she's in the last stage of scarlet fever. The actors all look like roasted turkeys. <laughs> roasted turkeys they're not wrong they're not they kind of look like <laughs> liver colored they do well, yeah. they do it's pretty awful yeah betty davis also famously said of color film i don't know if she was talking about this Becky movie Sharp, specifically but, but she did refer to it as garish tripe garish tripe herbert said that this was his last experiment with color that they pushed the technology too far and so they knew the limits of the technology right, it was their afterwards. last sort of experimental film right with the so, three strip. And, you know, that's, I, I I think that's kind of BS probably. Yeah. Yeah. Because their people were on this film. But, you know, ultimately, if you look at it that way, it's an interesting film for that. So that starts the golden era well, of Technicolor, right? It, it doesn't start it. There's, there are a few years, 36, 37, yeah. that there were more Technicolor films that came out. Some were successful, some aren't. We're not going to cover every Technicolor film, but we are going to cover a couple big ones here. Right. First one being in 1938, Adventures of Robin Hood. This, in my opinion, is really the first Technicolor feature film to really show what Technicolor can do. When I think Technicolor, I think this movie. Yeah. And what's interesting is that the color consultants were constantly at battle with the studio over the colors on this one because they said these aren't real. This is going to look like a comic book. Which was the point. Kind of the point. They weren't fans of it, but I think it turned out great. Everything, you know, the colors really bright. Everything shot kind of flat, but it had to be at the time. That was just a requirement of the film stock and the cameras. Right, yeah. I mean, I think this is the personification of this period of Technicolor film, though. Like... You think bright, you think colorful, you see these big grand sets, you see all the detail that they put into these sets because there's so much light on them. Yeah, there's so much light. So there's there's a lot of light, there's not a lot of creative lighting. Right, or emotional lighting. Right. I do have a few fun facts about Adventures of Robin Hood. Well, I love fun facts. I know you do. So Errol Flynn was not originally cast as Robin Hood because James Cagney was cast as Robin Hood originally. What? I know. Dude, Errol Flynn is Robin Hood. I know, I know. It's hard to imagine it. But uh, James Cagney was a great dancer. You know, he could have been nimble, and but... Can you imagine, though? <laughs> no, I can't. Prince John, you dirty rat. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so such a different movie, wouldn't it? It would be a completely different, but it would still be colorful. <laughs> Errol Flynn was relatively unknown at the time when he was cast in this, uh... One of the producers, Hal Wallace, had seen Captain Blood, which had Errol Flynn, directed by Michael Curtiz, and he thought, let's get this guy. He's a swashbuckler. Oh, he was in real life, too. Yeah. Yeah, he was basically like a pirate Yeah. <laughs> in his early career. The and then, and the, yeah, and then he became the <laughs> owner of the Zaka, which we've talked about. <laughs> Why do we say we've, the Zaka in, like, every episode? I don't know, because we love the Zaka <laughs> and the Zaka stories. We're just going to have to do a whole thing on the well, Zaka. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Eventually we will. So originally the director on the film was William Keeley, but Hal Wallace reportedly was not happy with how he was shooting the action scenes in the film. And so he fired him. Okay. And thinking back to Captain Blood, he thought, let's get Michael Curtiz in here. So we hire Michael Curtiz to come in. But rumor is that all the action scenes that William Keeley was fired over had already been shot, and they didn't want to reshoot them. So 
they bring in a guy to shoot better action, but apparently he only shot like the studio kind of the the talky stuff. Oh, there, I mean, there's that's action. the rumor. There's action in the studio. There's the famous scene up and down the steps like, where they're all shot in they're a sword studio. fighting. It's all but, shot in a studio, right? But but we're talking about the non action. But that scenes. is such a Hollywood thing, you know. <laughs> hey, we need you to come in uh, to punch up the action. <laughs> Only problem is the action's already shot, so uh, <laughs> you're going to have to make some real snappy dialogue to up the action ante. <laughs> That's what's going to happen, I think. Were you there? Yeah, I was there. I was, yeah. <laughs> was that Jack Warner on the phone again? It's Jack Warner. What's it's he always, calling? It's always Jack Why is Warner. Why calling them? I don't know. He's always, he's always calling everybody on the phone and talking like With that. With a smile. He's, he, well, he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael Curtiz and Errol Flynn, apparently they didn't get along, but they shot 12 films together over their career. I read Errol Flynn's autobiography, yeah. Wicked Wicked Ways. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, he said he hated him. In fact, So Curtiz was not allowed on the Zaka. Well, he hated him because he... Uh, you didn't answer the question. No, he was never on the Zaka. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, in fact, they got <laughs> into many fist fights on sets, various sets. I'm not saying on this set particularly i have one more thing my favorite fact about adventures of robin hood is about oh. the horse so olivia de Havilland's horse in the film the horse's name in real life was golden cloud oh golden cloud what a cute a name delightful name and only a few years later golden cloud's name changed to trigger whoa that's the- right the most Trigger, famous, the smartest horse in the movies. The smartest horse in the movies. That's what, what it he always is. says. That's what it always said at the beginning of it the Roy Rogers movies. Yeah, yeah. The smartest horse in the movies was in Adventures of Robin Hood as Maid Marin's horse. A four-legged friend, a four-legged friend. He'll never let you down. He's honest and faithful right up to the end. That wonderful one, two, three, four-legged friend. Your favorite horse. Everyone's favorite horse. (laughs) So that leads us into the year of Technicolor, which is 1939. In 1939, you had Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind, arguably two of the most famous three-strip Technicolor films. Well, and two of the greatest films ever made, so... Yeah, well, they often quote 1939 is the greatest year in... In film history. Film history, but then they only quote those two movies, right? Well, there's a couple other ones. Like what? I don't remember. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So the first one was Wizard of Oz. Bright, colorful, very similar to Adventures of Robin Hood in the color palette kind of way. Right. But it sold Technicolor in a way that Adventures of Robin Hood did not sell it. I think Wizard of Oz was basically a commercial for Technicolor. Yeah, it kind of was. Yeah, because the one scene when Dorothy's house lands in Oz and she goes from inside her house, which, which was all se- sepia tone, yeah. uh, into opens the door and into that Technicolor world. And when you think Technicolor, that's what you think of. Yeah, you think of that shot. And really, it kind of works as a before and after in a way. Well, yeah. It, well, I mean, this was Hollywood beforehand. Yeah, the and now color, we're opening the door. And this is the new Hollywood. Yeah. This is what color does for film, right? Right. I think that that single moment... That scene was shot all in color. Uh, they painted the set and the stand-in for Dorothy were all painted in that sepia tone. She steps out of frame and then Judy Garland steps into frame in color. And I know there's a story about the ruby slippers. The silver slippers were turned to the ruby red slippers by the Technicolor consultant team because the silver would have just reflected any light. So when they're on the yellow brick road, they kind of would have looked yellow. Or they would, yeah, or it would have looked like she had no feet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that would be That would have been image. weird, right? Let's go on to Gone with the Wind. If you think about Gone with the Wind compared to Wizard of Oz, think about how completely different those two films look. Wizard of Oz is super colorful and bright, and Gone with the Wind, moody, nuanced, and yeah. there's a reason. In 1939, there were improvements to the film stock. There was a brand new film stock, which could was faster and could shoot in lower light. Also, Technicolor had fixed an issue with their cameras. So there was an issue with the filters in the cameras that were causing them to lose two f-stops. That means that you would have to shoot in brighter light so you're you're not able to shoot in a lower light so imagine you've got film 
that can only shoot in bright lights. And then you've got a camera that also can only shoot in bright lights. So that's why all these ones beforehand were kind of outdoors. So flat bright. and brightly lit because right. they needed that light to expose right. the film. So for Gone with the Wind, they had brand new film stock that was better and they had fixed an issue with the camera. So that's why they're able to get all of this beautiful lighting. And with that more sensitive film stock, you got gradations of color and think of that beautiful sunset that's at the end of part one yeah. you know that i'll never go hungry again you could shoot a sunset with a fading you know striation of color right also too, well people laughed at selznick they said hey why are you shooting a drama in color this makes no sense exactly you know there's no dance scenes there's no musical aspects in here like why would you shoot a drama ever spend color. the money yeah it makes no sense to he us said just wait yeah. Boy, were they wrong? They were so wrong, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And they, I have a funny little story, too, uh, about um, when Selznick signed the deal with Technicolor, he guaranteed that a certain amount of uh, film stock footage would come back, a certain level. So saying we're going to shoot X amount of film. Yeah, well, they call it feet of film, right? Like yeah. what he didn't know, by the end of this movie, that was the longest film that Hollywood had ever put out. Yeah. It wasn't the longest film ever made. No, no. You know, I mean, you had Abel Gantz's Napoleon, yeah. which was rumored to be 12 hours originally and then <laughs> yeah. nine hours. The Hollywood had never put out anything this long. By the end of the shoot, they exceeded that footage minimum by four times. <laughs> Not only did they double it. Yeah, they quadrupled that. Why is Jack Warner involved? Oh, he's always on the phone. <laughs> Him and Selznick were good buds. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. So Gone with the Wind was really just a film that had a lot of excess in addition to all the footage of film that was shot yeah. it also had five directors wow it had 15 screenwriters which is really excessive at the time probably still excessive now but really then uh also it's rumored that all seven technicolor cameras that existed at the time were sent to shoot the first scene that they shot the burning of atlanta scene i think it's the first scene that they shot one of the first one of the not. first right yeah and What's cool is if you look at that, you can clearly see Clark Gable's face, but you don't see Vivian Lee's face because that is not her in the scene. That is a stunt double. Yeah, they hadn't even cast. Um, she had not been cast yet. Right. Another interesting thing, one of the things that you see burned down in that scene is actually part of the set of King Kong. Those are actually burning in the background, which is cool, but also Kind of sad. Oh, <laughs> burning the set. That's King Kong. Yeah. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. It's also the movie that they said killed Mont Westmore. Really? Yeah. He died shortly after this film because of exhaustion. Oh, poor Mont. So they say that Technicolor grew up with Gone with the Wind. That's when they really became the premier color film format because there were others that were around at the time. There was. Magna color, there was Warner color, everybody had their own color. There was True Color, which had a two color, a two strip, and a three strip version. And the two strip version was red and blue because they couldn't do the red and green because that had been patented. Right. So they did a red and blue, which gave it a really interesting look. Yeah, I love the the true color look. The blue is like kind of silvery and yeah, kind of turquoisey. The a oranges bit. are kind of rusty and it worked really well for the desert and for a lot of westerns because you didn't need the green. You didn't need it because you're right, in the nothing desert. Nothing was green. Yeah, basically, Technicolor owned Hollywood for over a decade. Yeah, right? it was the big guy in town. Yeah, it was if you if you wanted to make an A list uh, color film and you can afford it. Yep, you shot on Technicolor. You shot on strip. Technicolor three strip. And uh, it was all through the 40s and well into the 50s. Yeah, and it was really like that until the 1950s with television. The, the advent and, of television. And and the widescreen wars yep. and 3D and things like that. Right. And there were a couple 3D films that were shot in three strip. Oh, man. Yeah. That's rough. I know. So imagine this. Three strip Technicolor, right? There's three three film strips. But make that 3D. So there's now six Film strips. Yeah, three per for each eye. Real. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. And then yeah. you have to align all six of those together to create an image. Yeah. So imagine you have to match up all six <sighs> images. And Paramount actually owns a couple of them. One of them is Money from Home, which the 3D archive is working on right now. Oh, yeah. That's a Martin Lewis film, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And they are recombining that They're, because they are the only ones crazy enough and brave enough <laughs> to try it to, to try to put a 3D three strip film back together. Imagine, I mean, film shrinks, it warps, it cha- I mean, you got to line all that up each frame. Wow. Six times. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Yes, it is. And Anyways, it's we, uh, probably pretty overwhelming. I can't wait to see that, though, honestly. We, we digress. Well, you know, got to give a shout out to Bob Fermanek. Yeah, He's a great dude. I know. We love so. 3D Archive. <laughs> so what was the last film shot in Three Strip? Uh, the last film was Foxfire, 1954. Oh, the first year for Yeah, Vista but that Vision. was the last one shot in America. Right, because mm. they still use it in Europe. Yeah, and... they, use, they use it in Europe for a while. And uh, the last of Technicolor's processing plants to close was the one in Rome. Yeah. No, um, they've disassembled all of those, and you you cannot replicate that process anymore. No. But don't you have a little piece? Oh, no, I, you already showed that. No, didn't I didn't, yeah. actually. You I, have a little piece. I, I have this thing here called a pen belt, which is part of the printing process for the Technicolor film prints, the, the imbibition process. So this would hold the film and run through a big machine as all the colors were being layered on top this was part of a what 250 foot yeah about that a big like, loop big metal that would loop run through that, a system yeah and there's a really great video the george eastman house has a great video explaining this process this is such a cool artifact because these just don't exist anymore i mean who knows what this printed yeah i mean this could have printed so much stuff who knows who knows it's amazing and thank my friend mark for that so okay at this point with the death of kind of the three strip process, mm-hmm. Technicolor shifted gears into color processing of film. Right. Uh, using their imbibition process, they created prints for all of the major studios. So they would shoot on whatever film right. stock that they wanted, right? E- Eastman color or whatever. Then they would send it to the Technicolor plant to be processed and they would create these IB prints, uh, which are beautiful prints, very stable. Mm-hmm. They don't fade. Yeah, they're great for restoration purposes because they don't fade. Unlike, let's say, a negative was shot in Eastman Color. For example, To Catch a Thief, which had just worked on. Right. That negative is faded, but the imbibition prints of that film have not faded. So you can reference those. You screen those. You you set up a screening of a print, and you go in and you see what the colors really looked like. And we were able to just do that on right. the new restoration. So they're an important these. tool for restoration. Very important. Because, because you're able to see director intent um, uh, for colors and right. things like that, even though that director is no longer available to give you direct input. Correct. Right? Yeah. Also interesting, so that was shot in VistaVision. <laughs> and a handful of the three strip Technicolor cameras were converted to VistaVision cameras. Oh wow! So they they took the the housing and mm-hmm. then changed the insides to yep. pictures of Hitchcock shooting with some of these converted three strip. Technicolor was uh, a company that was constantly pivoting mm-hmm. with technology. When DVD reached its height, they turned the Hollywood plant into a DVD replication plant, and they were the number one DVD replication company. For over a decade, during the whole height of DVD. Well, they're still around today. It's uh, it's owned by a French company, I believe. Okay. And Technicolor sold some of their post-production facilities. Now those are owned by Streamland Media. And they rebranded them as Picture Shop, but the building still says Technicolor. We all still say still, Technicolor. You still refer to it as Technicolor, right? Because you just, I mean, it's, it's such, I don't know, a, there's such a prestige to that name. Yeah. Technicolor. And there always will be. Yeah. With Hollywood, uh, you know, Hollywood and Technicolor kind of grew up together. I hope they never take down that sign. I feel like that should be protected. I think it should be protected for sure. All right. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. But before we do... I want to do one more kind of like little fun thing. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite three strip Technicolor film? Hands down the red shoes. Oh. 1948. Yes. Don't even have to think about it. Red shoes. Beautiful film. Often considered one of the most beautiful films ever shot in Technicolor. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sure. All right. So that's mine. What's yours? Mine has also got a lot of ballet in it too. Mine is an American Paris 1951. 
big Gene Kelly fan. Absolutely love him. Um, and I just loved how he always pushed technology to capture dance in different ways. I just, yeah, I love that. Film. I feel like this is really more an advertisement for Gene Kelly. For <laughs> I love him yeah. so much. All right. There's so many people you love so much. <laughs> but we do love Technicolor. And this is the story of the company. Next time, we're going to tell the story of the people behind the company. So you heard us mention Herbert Kalmus a lot today. In the next episode, you're going to get a lot more of Herbert Kalmus and his wife, Natalie Kalmus, who worked at the company as well and who has over 300 credits to her name on IMDb. Yes. She was the head of their color consultant department, and they have quite a tale. You could call it a love story. You could call it a nightmare, a depending on yes, how you look at it, nightmare. honestly. It is, yeah. it is. So stay tuned for that. That's coming soon. Yeah, we'll do that one. Yeah, so uh, hope and you've enjoyed the Technicolor yeah. talk. There's more to come. And until next time, thanks for joining us here on, on Perf Dance. Dance. She's wet. <laughs> There's your outtake right there. Covered in dog drool. Oh. Water on the Why beard. It was water on the beard. Thanks, Stas. Refreshing. <laughs>